We are the modern Robin Hood. We take from the rich to give to the poor. It needs a lot of motivation, self-motivation. You see, you see the happiness in their faces. It touches you and you feel like, no, I should continue. A small plane, a great view, and a spirit of adventure. The passengers aboard this flight could be mistaken for tourists exploring exotic locations. But their mission is more noble. They are seasoned travelers on a mission to change lives. Access to healthcare is a serious challenge in Africa. Hospitals and clinics often find it difficult to employ enough trained medical staff to cope with the number of people needing care. Those living in rural areas are the most affected. The number of specialists produced are very few. And most of them, they don't like to come to up countries. They like to stay in big cities like in Dar es Salaam, Arusha, Mwanza, Mbeya. To get them in such a remote area, such what we call hard to reach regions, it's very difficult. Where specialists are available, many patients cannot afford treatment. Almost 800 children in the continent die every day because families do not have enough money to take them to hospital, according to international charities. The flying doctors decided that if patients cannot come to them, they will go to the patients and pay for their treatment. <laughs> Meet Dr. Peter O'Dwar. He has been a flying doctor for nine years. Today he is flying from Kenya's densely populated capital, Nairobi, to the rural west of the country. Here in western Kenya, the population is spread out and hospitals are far away. Today, Dr. Odwar is seeing around 20 patients. He and his team are going to operate on 22 cases before he leaves in three days. His job is to relieve people from humiliating and uncomfortable disabilities. He is one of just 20 doctors in East Africa qualified to treat these types of disfigurements. When you come out here, you see the need of the people here. You come, 30, 40 patients have come, have come here, all of them looking at waiting for you to do something for them. He is set to carry out operations worth up to 300,000 US dollars for free. <coughs> for Dr. Odor, a marathon of surgeries awaits. Some have wanted treatment for around 10 years. Some of these patients whom we look after here, we operate on here, you find they've had their disabilities for quite some time. Some of them even got banned when they were children or the young kids. 
the, by the time you're seeing them, they're seven, eight years, some of them are 10 years old. There was nobody in between to, to help them out. He had a tough choice on his hands. The potential of earning big money in the city or to travel to poor and remote places for a tiny fraction of the salary. What should I do? Do I also decide and stay and make money or do I come out? And I think I felt that maybe at least once in a while I should come and offer my services to these people. These needy people, at least in this region, who require uh, the services which they can't get. Foundation, Foundation, Fly Doc One. How do you read me, Hola? Fly Doc One Foundation Control, reading you fine. The Flying Doctors are run by the African Medical and Research Foundation, or AMREF. Uh, ETA Arusha 0725, three on board, Hola? Uh, Fly Doc One Foundation Control, copied Airborne Wilson 0725. AMREF is the biggest health development NGO in Africa. Its head office is in Nairobi, Kenya. Heading it up is Dr. Tegest Gurma. AMREF has uh, become a leading international African organization uh, with a headquarters in Africa. I think it's the only organization which has, international organization which has headquarters in Africa. The most important component is a trailer, which has been turned into a medical station. AMREF was born in 1957. At that time, the majority of the population lived in rural areas where roads were impossible to drive down. At that time, there was no road. <laughs> and at that time, most of the African communities were not having access to health. There was no health center, there were no doctors, there were no nurses. British-born surgeon Sir Michael Wood was inspired by his wife Susan's love of Africa to come to the continent. They based themselves in Nairobi, where he worked as a general surgeon, but he was regularly called to emergencies outside the city. How long? But it was in 1954 while learning plastic surgery in England, that he would go on to meet the British Sir Archibald Mackindoe and the American Tom Rees. Believing only that the sky was the limit, they thought up the idea of doctors who fly. We began to talk about the immensity of the problems of bringing health, particularly to the rural areas, where 85% of the population live in this part of the world. And um, after discussing this and trying to find ways of helping the missions and the other services run by the health authorities, we came to the conclusion that one of the first answers should be in the form of communications. And this, of course, meant the necessity for light aircraft. With his single-engined airplane, Michael would fly around East Africa, landing on rough airstrips that were built by the local communities. He visited hospitals and clinics run by missionaries. Operations would range from children with club feet, to delivering babies, to plastic surgery on patients with cleft lips. By 1960, AMREF had become an international organization that raised funds for its flying doctor service. I'm the flying doctor service because it was speaking and I assist you. Cash would come from donors in Europe and North America. Captain, we have just had a request to fly to uh, Soroti. Soroti, yeah. And the control room are asking what time are we taking. As it grew, the Flying Doctors Service became known as the Outreach Program. And, uh, we should be open in the next 10 minutes. Okay. Yeah. To boost the program's growth, 
AMREF launched a private air ambulance service alongside its humanitarian function. Patients pay for emergency evacuations. Junior, move to the Migu. You guys sit there? Yes. Good. We are the modern, modern Robin Hood. So what we try to do is we, we take from the rich to give to the poor. Now by generating a surplus and in income that way through the emergency services, um, we channel that income directly into the outreach program. Today, AMREF's outreach program works with 400 specialists. How is the pain now? Uh, the neck. The neck is hurt? Yeah. The types of problems it now deals with has also expanded to tumors, broken bones, general surgery, urology, gynecology, and specialist care for children. Medical professionals at teaching hospitals across the continent volunteer to be flying doctors. We are on the way to the hospital. The patient remains stable, blood pressure 130 over 55. At rate 92. They are then selected to travel to remote regions in their own or other African countries based on their availability and the need at that time. More than 10 years ago, Ethiopian surgeon Asrat Mengiste signed up to be a flying doctor. In his early years, he carried out surgeries in remote parts of Ethiopia. He went on to operate in 13 other countries across the continent. Dr. Mengiste now heads AMREF's outreach program. AMREF outreach program uh, has a uh, regular outreach visits in 156 hospitals right now, and regular in uh, countries like Kenya, Tanzania, Ethiopia, Uganda, South Sudan, and Senegal. Well, as on request, we also go to Burundi, Rwanda, Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, Republic of Congo, Brazzaville, Liberia, Niger, Chad, in Nigeria. The outreach program is just one part of what is now a multi-layered organization. AMREF has a disease prevention arm aiming to prevent HIV and AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria. It also has projects to improve water and sanitation in rural communities. AMREF often sends doctors to treat people in emergency situations, including wars or terrorist attacks. Here in South Sudan, civil war has killed more than 1.5 million people. But instead of running from trouble, AMREF has been sending its doctors into the heart of the war zone to help out, a commitment not many would make. AMREF orthopedic surgeon Dr. Peter Kilonzo was brave enough to travel to the troubled region to treat people with gunshot wounds and bone fractures. Hospitals make requests based on their needs. Yuba requested uh, an orthopedic surgeon to come here. He was based at Juba Hospital for one week, where he found more than 100 patients needing his attention. The commonest problem here is uh, unattended fractures. I've got a few with infections. The, infection, the, the fractures are mainly from gunshot injuries and a few 
from road traffic accidents. We expect to do about 12 patients a day. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is the guy with a gunshot injury on the elbow and they completely destroyed the joint. So what we need to do is put the joint in a more functional position. We have got two operating rooms. That gives us almost 120 patients in the 10 days that we shall be around. This is not the first time AMREF has sent Dr. Kilonzo to South Sudan. Medical doctors still remember how he benefited patients he treated a year ago. Last year we were operated on a patient with slow traffic accident with a fractured leg. So after uh, Dr. Kilonzo operated on him, then I decided the patient after seven days, when the wound healed, then he's now following up, he's doing well. He's a young guy of 21 years, so he has resumed his normal life now. And that's uh, the help from Dr. Clonza. Tension. Tension, but it's peaceful. It really gives you a good feeling to attend to these people, otherwise I have no option. Although AMREF's pilots are not on the front line treating patients, they have the same sense of commitment as the doctors. Whatever I do at the end of the day, I've probably made a mark on someone's life, maybe saved a life. For me, that satisfaction is what really gets me to wake up in the morning and go to work for AMREF. Captain Ephraim Morigo earns much less than he would if he worked for a big airline, and he has to work much longer hours. His next trip is to Tanzania to drop doctors to rural areas in the country. Challenges could be wherever you're going to, maybe the runway is flooded, uh, you cannot land there, or probably it's raining over there. You've got to think of um, what is your alternative. Because at the same, same time, apart from being safe, you want to get these doctors to where they want to go to because they have a schedule, there are people waiting in queues there for them to serve them. So you don't want to delay it for so long. So you try as much as possible to get them to where they are going to. He likes going to the remote places Amref sends him, where seeing a plane is an exciting new experience for the locals. The locals there have probably never seen an aeroplane in their life. Uh, they have probably never interacted with a pilot or a doctor in that case. And uh, you always see the excitement when uh, after you land and they are coming towards the plane, they are cheering you up, they are waving at you. For children, AMREF might even be an inspiration for their future careers. You kind of think after that probably that kid is going to try and go work hard in school and you know, probably get, try and become a pilot or a doctor you know, later on in life. Amref's commitment to the health of people in rural regions has impacted patients all over Africa. In some of these areas deep in the countryside, residents either get Amref treatment or no treatment at all. This is Kishapu district in Tanzania. Hospitals are far away and too expensive to travel to for the people who live here. If it was not for AMREF, Regina Joseph's life would have been haunted by a debilitating and embarrassing problem. I'm a little 
No guys are in Hindi. I'm not saying Hindi. Miss Aurora the fool. The fool go I three operations. I She got pregnant when she was 18 and was in labor for three days because her family could not afford to get her to the nearest hospital to see a midwife. This caused severe damage to her organs and left her incontinent, a condition called fistula. This broke down her marriage and she was no longer accepted by the community where she lived. You get a difficult labor, you get complication, you lose a child, you start being incontinent. That is actually a big stigma for a woman in Africa. It's not accepted by the family, he's always smelling urine, so he, he doesn't get married. I mean, he loses a marriage, he doesn't have a child, so he's a, a, a social outcast. Amrev paid for Regina's treatment. This meant she began to lead a normal life again, and she was no longer ostracized in her village. The work the flying doctors do in the remote regions where it operates is not without its challenges. Dr. Odor works in a small team with few resources. He is preparing to operate on a young girl with a cleft lip. Little Miriam is one of around 20,000 children born each year in Africa with this deformity. This debilitating problem prevents children from eating properly. It also causes them to be bullied and ridiculed at school and in their communities. If the operation were not free, Miriam's mother would not be able to pay the $930 typically charged by city hospitals. Uh, these are hardship areas. The machines you are using, sometimes you find that they are outdated. You are forced to, at certain times to improvise. You try as much as possible to do most of the things by yourself. Although there are situations where you find that you need teamwork. What has just happened, Doctor? Hmm? What has happened? <laughs> Power has gone off. It usually happens. Yeah, it, yeah. Although not so often, but it happens, and it can happen in the middle of your surgery. One false move in the dark could injure Miriam even more than before. Dr. Odor's headlamp is close at hand. But his main worry is the machine that was preventing Miriam from bleeding can no longer be powered up. The patient will bleed, so maybe now what will be forced is maybe just to put pressure over the bleeding area and wait. If you don't do that, then your patient will die. It takes just a few hours for a patient to bleed to death. This power losses on and off, on and off, they basically interfere with your thought process and in the long run basically make your surgery longer. So <clears throat> your patient ends up getting too much anesthesia for nothing. But the main thing really is uh, the bleeding. That's really our main concern. And then you see, you see now like even some of these machines that we're using require power. So now when you're using this machine and then now there's no power, then uh, Basically, it means you can't, you can't use it. So you can't use the machine here to stop bleeding, and then you can't see the bleeding area because the whole area is dark. 
Yesterday we operated, I think, throughout. We, we didn't have uh, any problem. But some, I think, today we've been unfortunate. We've had about three, four power outages. This time, the power outage lasted for around 15 minutes. Miriam had managed to hold on. Hile niliwana kiingia ndani, nilikuwa na wasiwasi sana. Na mwe wangu likuwa unadunda sana. Lakini saa hivi li nimemuona, nimesikia kufurai sana. Kwa sababu hametengenezwa, na dhani wenzaki wenye ulikuwa na mcheka, wata mcheka, wata mcheka tena. Nijisikia tu vizuri. Nishona. A unique spirit characterizes the Flying Doctor's teams. It needs a lot of motivation, self-motivation. If you are not self-motivated, that's one thing that sometimes you might not be strong enough to persevere the long hours of surgeries because sometimes you have a list that can take you till the night. So you are just to be strong and then you have that heart of wanting to help. You know, the volunteerism work is very enriching, both spiritually and professionally and emotionally. I think that's the driving force. Some of these mothers whose children we've operated upon, you see, you see the happiness in their faces. This, I think it touches you and you feel like, no, I should continue, I should continue. In less than 60 years, Amref has grown from having three doctors to 400 across Africa. Its services have multiplied through training of local doctors. It is hoped that in the next 60 years, this record will more than double. I think maybe what we'd like to say is, I think we need more of us Africans doing this so that we don't focus too much on uh, the people coming from the West to come and provide these charity services. We want to look at ourselves as self-sufficient. So if you're self-sufficient, I believe we have the professionals, or maybe they're not many but they are there. So I think maybe what is required is just a philanthropic heart to enable somebody to come out and do this.